passion that this next speaker has and, and the drive that he has. And his eyes are wide open about everything around him. And I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker who will be speaking about raising one million U.S. dollars for Honduras. Please welcome Shin Fujiyama. All right. All right, here we go. Um, so my tipping point for my project in Honduras happened in 2006. Uh, I was a college student uh, in a small liberal arts school called the University of Mary Washington in Virginia, where I grew up. And um, one of my buddies, uh, Bob, told me, you know, everything that we've done so far, none, nothing has worked. Let's just go knock on the door of the biggest philanthropist in the city, Doris Buffett. Let's just do this. And I asked Bob, yeah, that name sounds really familiar, Doris Buffett. I mean, I've heard of that last name before. Um, so he said, yeah, she's uh, actually the sister of Warren Buffett, the richest man on the planet. She lives two blocks away from your dorm room. And I was like, oh my God, Bob, you are kidding me. Like, we can't do this. Like, she's way too famous for us. I'm just a 21-year-old college kid. And he said, well, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that can happen? So I said, okay, let's give it a try. So the next day, on a Friday afternoon, we walked those two blocks to Doris Buffett's house. And I remember my palms were so sweaty. I was so nervous. I almost didn't knock on her door. I almost just walked away at the moment. But I decided to knock on her door. Um, and, uh, and a secretary answered the door and let us in. Um, so Bob and I are in her house. Um, she leads us through this like little elevator that's uh, inside her house. And we get to the you know, second, second story, and there's this piano in the corner of the room that's like playing on its own. And I was like, oh my god, where are we, Bob? Like, what have you gotten me into? Um, so I'm just staring at him like, oh, it's just a bad idea. But a very nice uh, lady uh, comes in, and it was Doris. And she was like, hi, you know, yeah, how can I help you? And I was like, hi, Doris, I'm Shin Fujiyama, I'm here. Uh, I got to tell you something. I am raising $100,000 for an orphanage in Honduras, and I need your help. And she was like, oh, okay, okay, slow down, slow down. Tell me what your story is, and tell me why Honduras. So this is the story that I told her. You know, um, the past five to ten years, things have been kind of happening, I think, especially with people from our generation. Um, in the U.S., at least, a lot of people are graduating, even from Ivy schools, instead of trying to get jobs in, um, you know, big investment firms, banking jobs, things like that. They're all applying to work for Teach for America. A lot of my friends in college were going all over the world and not going on overseas vacations, but they were volunteering overseas. It was getting really popular with my, uh, with, uh, my friends. And my little sister, Cosmo, who was studying at, a, at another university, she was going to Nicaragua, she was going to Peru, volunteering for these human rights organizations, um, teaching English, and I was really jealous. So I wanted to do something like that too. So one day, you know, I just wanted to jump on the bandwagon. At the cafeteria in the university where I used to work uh, as a dishwasher, I saw this little green flyer. And it was for a trip, a volunteer trip to Haiti to build a school there. So I got really excited and I called the guy up and I was like, hey, can I join? Like, I'm Shin, you know, I, I want to do this. Um, so the guy was like, yeah, you know, you're a little late, but you can come we'll start raising money for the trip and we'll go to Haiti together. I got really excited, I raised all the money real quick. Um, but unfortunately that year, there was a coup in Haiti and violence was erupting and our trip was canceled. And I was so devastated. I was just in a state of depression for a while. I didn't know what to do. Um, we'd already bought the tickets, I had already raised the money. Um, however, at the same time, there was a small girls shelter in Honduras that was seeking a group of volunteers to come down on that exact same week we were supposed to go to Haiti. And somehow that, um, that uh, shelter in Honduras contacted the leader of our, our uh, trip um, organizer and asked them if he knew of any volunteers that were interested in coming to Honduras, this small uh, country in Central America. So he organized a meeting with all of us, all the students that were supposed to go to Haiti and was like, guys, listen, what do you guys think? Let's go to Honduras instead. We can just switch the tickets. What do you guys want? You know, everyone else, was, everyone was, you know, very excited. And they're like, yeah, let's just go to Honduras. It's not that much farther. I was that guy, you know, in the corner. I was like, I don't know. You know, I want to go to Haiti. I don't know about Honduras. I don't have any good feelings about it. I don't even know where it is, you know. Um, <laughs> but I was like, well, it's somewhere in South America, right? But it's in Central America, if you didn't know. Um, but, uh, you know, we just switched the plane ticket and thinking, yeah, I'll just might as well go. I already have the tickets. I'm just going to go once and, you know, that'll be it. 
The second I flew in, I fell in love with the country, with the children. And as soon as I got back to campus, I got my uh, return flight to Honduras just for three months later for my spring break. Um, and since then, I've been volunteering with every winter break, spring break, summer break, every opportunity that I had. Um, I was able to work as a translator for a, a couple of aid workers, um, and I was working um, washing dishes. So, you know, there I am in Honduras, not necessarily volunteering because I had a religious calling or because I had, you know, I felt a sense of uh, obligation or anything like that because I come from a, you know, a wealthier country. It wasn't anything like that. I was really enjoying myself, um, volunteering, getting to meet, uh, making friends with people from another culture, learning Spanish, uh, new words every day, uh, learning to dance the salsa, or at least trying, right? I, I never got that, uh, too good at that. Um, but, um, you know, one day an aid worker uh, told me, you know, it's great that, you know, you guys are volunteering here. Um, you come here, you know, for a week or two and, and go back home and come back again. It's great what you're doing, but you have an opportunity here. Why don't you take what you're doing to the next step um, and think about all the other 365 days that you're back in the U.S. You come from a privileged, uh, middle-class uh, background in the suburbs of um, the United States. So what are you going to do about that when you're back home? So I was like, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Maybe there is something that I can do, even though I'm not a doctor, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a 21-year-old student, but we'll give it a try. So around then, when I was volunteering in Honduras, a small, small orphanage in northern Honduras um, was really struggling financially. And they came to me and said, listen, we're trying to raise $100,000 um, to keep our project going and keep our, our kids in school. Can you help us? Or do you know anyone that can help? Maybe a doctors or lawyers? Um, so I said, well, I, you know, I can help. You know, I'm a student. I, I think I can do something, right? So I told them that, okay, I'm going to raise $100,000 for you guys. I'm going to do that. Um, so I called my sister and I said, you know, we're going to do this. So she started raising money on her campus. I started raising money m on my campus. And the first event I did, I, I started collecting pennies on a penny drive. Um, Oh, yeah, I forgot to do the slides right there. Uh, little Honduras. Penny drives, uh, meaning collecting spare change. Very little. Um, the first event I did, it took me all day. I collected $26. Um, that's all I, I collected. I just wasn't very good. Um, so, I was, you know, I was a little discouraged. But um, I figured, okay, maybe I just need to get more people involved. You know, I had 5,000 students in my university. Maybe some of them want to come. So I organized a little meeting, I, I uh, booked a little room, I got all the chairs ready, extra chairs in case all these people showed up. You know, 5,000 students, a lot of people have to come. I made phone calls, put up flyers and everything. You know, 7 o'clock, 7.15, 7.20, like, where is everybody, you know? Did I write the wrong time? Two people came, um, and that was all. But with them, we started, we started, we started small. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, with our goal, with a goal of $100,000, we were trying to do stuff, and desperately, I was just going around the neighborhood knocking on doors. And that's when my friend Bob told me we should knock on Doris Buffett's door. So, going back to her house, to Doris's house, um, she said, okay, okay, you know, you're, you're a young man, I like how you're thinking, I like how you're thinking bold, you're thinking big, I like that. So, I want to help you, but I don't want to make this easy, I want to give you a little challenge. So, okay. She just looked me in the eyes and she said, all right, Shin, if you can raise $33,000 in the next 60 days before school ends, I will give you the $66,000 you need to meet, uh, reach your goal, $100,000. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I got to sign like 100 pages of stuff. And she was like, oh, that's chump change to me. That's nothing. Go out and do it. She was the first adult that believed in us and me and my friends back in, back in college. So I gave her a big hug. I squeezed her real hard, and I said, Doris, thank you. I will be back. I promise to you that I'm going to meet this challenge. I ran out the door, uh, went to my soccer practice, uh, late, obviously, because of the meeting, but I told everybody about it. And they were like, wow, that's really cool, you know? Uh, and people started just donating money, people who had never donated money. And I later found out that um, what was happening was called the Parkinson's Law, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, it's like the magic of the imminent deadline. You know when you have like a final exam or something for students, you really kind of procrastinate, but all of a sudden, like the night before, you're like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta study, and this like hidden, untapped energy comes out, right? And you're able to do okay. So procrastinating is not necessarily a bad thing because it, uh, you know, brings out this like energy inside you that you never knew existed. So that's what was happening. We had really 
strong sense of urgency um, to raise this money. So um, I realized I needed to spend the limited time I had on very um, on uh, fundraising events that gave me the best uh, return on the time spent. So I experimented with a lot of events and came to the conclusion that bake sales, selling cookies, surprisingly, uh, doing benefit parties, um, asking for donations on weekends, um, and writing letters to friends and families were the three most um, uh, best events for the time spent. Um, you know, little tricks like for bake sales, sometimes I didn't ask for a specific amount of donation. I just asked a, a suggested donation. People would give me a dollar, two dollars, five dollars for a cookie. Uh, when I had a benefit party, I would charge six dollars instead of five and ask them, hey, do you want change? And they'll be like, oh, just keep the change. And you get ten dollars instead of five. So there's little tricks, there are little tricks that you can do. Um, and I was like really challenging myself, you know, to figure this out. Um, but still, doing all those events, I knew when I calculated there was no way I was going to reach that $33,000 goal. So my sister uh, raising money in her school and me raising money in my school, we realized we needed to get a lot more people involved. You know, we can't do this alone, but we can get a lot more other people involved. So I wrote this little speech, I created a video, and I got a list of all the different campus clubs at the university, all the different churches in the city, all the different elementary schools, high schools, rotary clubs, and I contacted every single one of them and gave 60 speeches in 60 days. Now my speeches in the beginning were terrible, but I got, you know, overcame my fear of speaking in, in public, and I asked them to uh, come to this walkathon we were organizing, um, similar to a marathon except people walk, and I told everybody to come. Um, so the last day of school, you know, we had raised about $10,000, not nearly close enough to what we needed to raise. Um, and it was raining that day, and you know, my friends and I are setting up the table, and I'm like, gosh, no one's going to show up. We're not going to meet. We're not going to meet this challenge, you know. Ah, no way. Um, so I go back to my room to take a shower because it was raining. I was all wet. Um, and when I go out, miraculously, like I got, as if a movie or something, the sun's coming out. You know, the clouds are parting, and it's like a beautiful day. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe we have hope. I go outside, I see a throng of students there, all in green t-shirts from my sister's university, the College of William & Mary. They had all come, about 100 of them drove three hours to get there. And literally, by the time we started the event, when we expected 100 people to show up, we had more than 2,000 people there, and the course that we had was so packed, people couldn't like barely walk. Um, so we had literally thousands of people walking for Honduras. I don't think some of them probably couldn't point to Honduras on a map, but they were really excited. Um, you know, all these students from all over. Um, so here they are. Here we are raising money. And at the end of the day, I was like, wow, you know, to my friend Nick, like, I think we did great. Yeah, maybe we reached like $25,000. Maybe Doris will cut us some slack. Maybe she'll give us the money, uh, you know, even if we don't reach the goal. And he was like, yeah, counting all the, you know, the coins, the dollar bills. We didn't have a website. We didn't even have, like, online donations. So it was all in cash. You can just imagine, like, you know, what people were thinking about all these wads of cash we had in coins, what we were selling, um, but uh, cookies, you know. Um, so it was literally getting dark, and I was like, Nick, I'm really getting worried. It's like dark. We have all this money. Tell me how much we raised. And he said, Shen, I just finished counting. You want to know how much we raised? Two months. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to know. I'm too nervous. No, no, no. But he was like, Shen, we just raised $82,000 in two months. So, thank you. So the next day, I told Doris about the great news, and she had the check ready, $66,000. Um, like that, she kept her word. Um, and I calculated we had raised $148,000 in literally two months um, when we started with just $26. So, you know, I think people were pretty impressed. And um, the following year, we continued to do our work. Um, we raised $248,000 the following year. Um, I graduated in 2007, and the students kept raising money without me. And just this year, we actually surpassed $1 million for raising funds for children in Honduras. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those are mostly from very small donations, you know, $5 donations, things like that, doing bake sales. You know, it really adds up. It really does. Um, so since then, after I graduated, I decided to work full-time for the organization that we created called Students Helping Honduras. It became a, f a formal nonprofit, an NGO, and I moved to Honduras with my sister. Um, so since then, um, you know, I've been focusing on three things. Um, one, 
trying to create an organization in the U.S. and, and all over the world to be able to uh, connect all these students who want to get involved to raise funds. Um, we have, uh, well, we started in, in, in two universities. We have 50 high schools and universities involved raising funds. Uh, we have high schools and universities in the U.S., also in Korea, um, also in Honduras itself. There was a high school that raised $3,000 for a project, and there were a high school in Honduras. Um, this has been amazing, and one of my goals is to create 1,000 chapters in the next 10 years. It's an ambitious goal, but um, we've been able to make it this far. Um, also in Honduras, I'm trying to create a very strong organization where for every dollar that we raise, we use it on very high-impact projects. Um, and, you know, we're, we're experimenting with a lot of things, but we're coming to the conclusion this is a uh, village that we rebuilt after a hurricane. Um, this is a library. That uh, education is quite possibly the best investment that we can make. Um, those are all the students actually working together, students coming down, um, build, building the library with all the families. Um, there's a, uh, classrooms that we build, um, a computer lab, um, and actually we are able to connect these kids in Honduras with kids from schools in Thailand, kids from schools in Cambodia, Uganda, so they're aware of what's, what else is going on in the world. And I had an idea yesterday that I'm going to start showing these TED Talks to our kids in Honduras because if you didn't know this, um, you have like uh, the subtitle options for like all these 26 different languages. So um, the kids um, in Honduras are going to start watching TED. I think it's kind of cool. Um, so these are some of the projects we do. Uh, we give out scholarships, of course, to kids. Provide clean water. That's a water tower. Um, one of our scholarship recipients. This is Julie. Uh, she lived in a small shanty town, um, but uh, she's one of our top scholarship recipients. She's one of my heroes. Um, she became the valedictorian of the elementary school that we built, and then now is the first girl in her whole village to go to high school. And we're supporting her, and we're so proud of her. Um, so, like I said, these are some of the goals that I have. In addition to all the students coming down, um, we had five students come down to volunteer with us the first year. Um, now we've surpassed uh, 1,000 volunteers. We're, we're literally getting um, a wait lists of, of students and young people that want to come volunteer with us, high school students, college students, all kinds. Um, so um, I'm literally running a small nonprofit travel company with uh, buses and vehicles and hotels and all that stuff in Honduras uh, to be able to accommodate all these volunteers. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the past uh, three years since I graduated. It's just so important, I feel, that you know, for people, especially for you know, young people who come from privileged middle class backgrounds like in the U.S. suburbs, it's a good thing to go out and see what's out there. Um, you know, it's okay to build fences and high walls and stuff, but I think it's the communication, it's the, it's the conversations that we have with people who are different with us um, and the friendships that we form that I think um, that's what's important, you know. Um, I think people are way too scared of people who are different from us, especially in the U.S., of immigrants, um, people who practice different religions. So I think this is the best way to break down ba uh, barriers by volunteering. Um, again, we actually had a volunteer from Thailand, from Bangkok, um, come to volunteer with us uh, in Honduras. So it's literally people from all over the world. Um, so I never really had a, you know, long-term plan, a 10-year strategic plan or anything. I kind of, by trial and error, one action led to another action, then to the next. This is a little quote by my favorite author, Timothy Ferris. If it's important to you and you want to do it, eventually just do it and correct course along the way, uh, going, uh, directing it more towards, mostly towards the young people in this room and everywhere else watching. Um, so. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank you, Shin.